This session is something that I think is exceptionally important to many of those attending here, but ironically I think isn't one that we often have in the scientific meetings within the field of ocular oncology. We're so focused on trying to save the children and save their eyes and deal with those issues. And we know about a lot of issues that happen as an adults, but we may not spend as much time talking about it. So this session, uh, I um, am uh, accompanied by people I've known for years and truly honored and appreciative to, to work with them. Uh, Catherine Payton leads the program in Canada. You've heard her, uh, sorry, in uh, the western part of Canada, I should say. Uh, David Freyer is a pediatric and adult um, oncologist who uh, his focus on, is on survivorship within the LA group. And Ruth Kleinerman, I should say, I've known since I was a medical student. She probably remembers me when I was six foot tall and had a lot of hair, and that's a long time ago. Um, we're going to start today uh, by Dr. Kleinerman, um, starting out with a talk entitled Secondary Tumors in the Retinoblastoma Population. Then we'll follow up with Dr. Freyer talking about survivorship clinics, very relevant to this population. Dr. Payton will talk about brain tumors, and then I'll talk a little bit about how to deal with the primary care provider. Dr. Klein. Thank you. Great. Uh, first, I want to thank the organization for inviting me to speak and to Dan, who I guess I have known for a long time. He did used to have look very different. A long, long okay. time so ago. So I'm going to be, um, I'm, and you've heard from many people earlier, who gave earlier talks about the survival in the United States is quite good for retinoblastoma, but one of the problems is secondary tumors. Um, and this one, I'm, I've been asked to talk about this today. And which one? Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. So this one? Yeah. Okay, I went too far. All right, I, I just want to give you a quick outline. I'm going to talk about second cancer, sort of what, who's at risk, and when. And I'm going to focus on three second cancers that occur fair, um, with some frequency in retinoblastoma survivors. That's bone tumors, soft tissue tumors, and melanoma. I'm just going to focus on these three. So first I wanted to give you a little background. What is a second cancer? Because we talk about second cancers, but I just wanted to emphasize these are new primary cancers of a different tissue type than retinoblastoma. Um, they're not recurrent retinoblastomas and they're not metastatic retinoblastoma. So what are some of the causes of second cancers? They're usually caused by a combination of factors. I think the question came up earlier today, is it genetic susceptibility or is it treatment? And I think it's a combination of both. There's genetics, there's having a uh, RB1 germline mutation, then there's treatment for retinoblastoma, which historically has been radiation and chemotherapy, and then there maybe are some lifestyle choices, such as smoking and sun exposure, that can contribute to risk. So who's at risk for these second cancer? Survivors who have had cancer in both eyes who have a germline mutation are at risk as they get older for second tumors. Survivors who have cancer in one eye without any family history and with no RB germline mutation are not at higher risk of developing a second cancer. They're no higher than the general population. And as I mentioned earlier, the most common second cancers after retinoblastoma are bone cancers, and about 35% of all second cancers that do occur are bone cancers. Another 35% of second cancers that occur are soft tissue sarcomas, and about 12% of second cancers are melanoma. And then the remaining cancers are often a combination of breast, bladder, lung, and other cancers. So bone cancer, which is often referred to by people as osteosarcoma, it's the most common type of bone cancer, um, is a very high risk in the retinoblastoma population, approximately 3.5 per thousand persons. Um, we found in our studies, and we've been studying patients who were treated in New York and Boston as far back as 1914 up through 1996, that uh, tumors are occurring in the head starting at ages four up through age 50. And tumors that occur in the lower legs and arms, which the lower legs don't really get any radiation, but those tumors are occurring from approximately five years, but only up through age 26, which is what you might see in the general population who get osteosarcoma. And we have found that males are at higher risk than females for osteosarcoma. And again, it's a combination, we found it to be a combination of genetics, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy that increase the risk for these second cancers. 
Soft tissue sarcoma, also a high risk compared to the general population. And we have found um, soft tissue sarcomas do occur in the head, which is pretty unusual, and they occur as early as age two, all the way up through age 53. And we think these are really a combination of link between the radiotherapy and genetic susceptibility. And soft tissue sarcomas that occur in the body can appear as early as age six, and we have data to show that they're occurring up through age 51. Females seem to be at somewhat higher risk than males, and again, it's a combination of genetics, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy that are related to the appearance of these second cancers. Um, some of you may know this, but if not, the soft tissue sarcomas encompass a lot of different tumors, and they can occur in organs, blood vessels, um, muscle, muscular tissue within really any connective tissue. And the most common type that we've documented among retinoblastoma survivors is a soft tissue sarcoma called a leiomyosarcoma. Most of these have been developing after the age of 30. This is a fairly common soft tissue sarcoma even in the general population. And it's interesting in this population that we found this to be occurring in females in the uterus, and in males it's most predominantly in the head. Melanoma is the third second cancer I wanted to talk about. This is also a high risk in, this, in the retinoblastoma survivor population compared to the general population. Ages, melanoma usually doesn't appear until the late teens, early 20s, which is what you would find in the general population. Um, we found in our data that if you have a family history of RB, there may be a slightly higher risk for melanoma. Males and females tend to be at the same risk. We've not found that treatment's really related to the appearance of melanoma. We think it's more related to genetics, whether or not you may have dysplastic nevi, which are abnormal moles, and also sun exposure, we think is related. So those are the three second cancers. So what's your risk? So by age 50, what we found in our cohort was that one in three hereditary retinoblastoma survivors have developed another cancer whereas only one in 20 of the non-hereditary retinoblastoma survivors have developed another cancer. Oops. So this is similar to another graph you saw earlier, but this shows that for unilateral patients, and if you look at their cumulative incidence of a second cancer over time, if you look at the blue line as it goes along at 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, they have only a 5.6.9% chance of developing a second cancer, whereas the red line, which represents bilateral survivors, shows that as time goes on, their risk of developing a second cancer accumulates to 36% at 50 years, and that's where the one in three comes from. So in terms of the future, we're continuing to follow our cohort. We are, at the National Cancer Institute, we're following the largest cohort in the United States of long-term survivors. And it's important in terms of studying second cancers to be able to have enough time passing to be able to see what the real risk of second cancers is. Um, we're also doing a series of genetic studies because we're interested in evaluating the molecular profile of second cancers in relation to treatment to RB, and we're also looking to see whether or not the location and type of RB1 mutation you have may predispose to a specific second cancer. But this work is all in progress, and we don't have an answer yet for that. So I would like to acknowledge the RB survivors and their families who have responded and are to our surveys and made our research possible, um, and also my colleagues at the National Cancer Institute, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, MD Anderson Cancer Center, we've worked with the radiation group there, and Tufts New England Medical Center. So I wanted to thank you and also point out we do have a, um, a website that we set up based on our study which provides sort of an update on our publications from our data and also has some general cancer prevention guidelines and recommendations. Thank you. So we'll take questions at the end for discussion. Uh, now, Dr. Freyer will uh, present his uh, manuscript entitled, entitled Cancer Survivorship Clinic, Who Should Be Referred and Why? Great. Well, thanks, Dan. And I'd like to acknowledge my uh, other panelists and also uh, thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to uh, participate in the conference this uh, last couple of days. 
So I'd actually like to start with the uh, answer and give it all away with the first slide. Um, and then I'll uh, circle back, hopefully explain along the way uh, how we reach some of these answers. So I was asked to answer two questions, basically, who should be referred to a cancer survivorship clinic and why? So the answer to the first question is that, uh, in my opinion, any child or adult treated for retinoblastoma uh, would be a candidate for this type of a clinic. And why should they be referred? It would be for any one or all of the following reasons. To monitor health as it relates to retinoblastoma, genetic status, and prior cancer treatment. Uh, to receive treatment for related health problems that may develop to be informed about health risks and wellness, and to access psychosocial support and uh, resources. So first of all, I think it's important to make sure that we're all uh, in uh, the same understanding of what cancer survivorship is. And that begins with understanding who a cancer survivor is. And it, it actually is, uh, the answer is not as simple as it might seem. So uh, there is one definition of cancer survivor given by the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship and the Office for Cancer Survivorship at the NCI, which is that it's anybody who's been diagnosed with cancer, and that includes any patients who are on or off treatment, uh, those who have uh, been cured, those who are relapsed, and any combination of that, as well as uh, patients who are affected, or individuals who are affected by cancer, including family members and friends. So it's a very broad definition. And I think philosophically this makes sense, but for a, a, a discussion like the one that we're going to have right now, it's a little complicated. So pragmatically speaking, for the purposes of this uh, discussion, uh, I refer to a cancer survivor as anyone who has completed cancer treatment. And accordingly, what is cancer survivorship? Uh, I, this is my own definition. I, th I think it encompasses activities that are related to care after cancer. Uh, for patients or oneself, so even, either given by providers or provided for oneself, aimed at maximizing physical and emotional health and quality of life. So it's a very sort of positive definition, not just looking for prob problems. So what are cancer survivorships? Uh, what are they, cancer survivorship clinics, what are they and, and what are they for? Well, in, in essence, they're focused on the needs of cancer survivors, and, and this encompasses three major areas. Uh, the first is monitoring for side effects after treatment. Uh, the second is educating uh, patients and their families about health risks and prevention of health problems. And then uh, the third is addressing a number of uh, challenges that relate to emotional development of uh, informational and financial uh, issues. And by informational, I'm, I'm sort of referring to the second issue, which is uh, educating patients about health risks and prevention. Typically, cancer survivorship clinics involve uh, a multidisciplinary team. Uh, many include a physician uh, who focuses in cancer survivorship, uh, a nurse practitioner or physician assistant who has a focus in that area, uh, a social worker, and then sometimes to varying degrees, other health professionals such as nutritionists, um, occupational or physical therapists, uh, and so forth. Um, but what they all have in common is a shared expertise or a commitment to cancer survivorship, which is a discipline that uh, has its own uh, uh, content and uh, expertise needed to address the many issues that our uh, long-term survivors face. So I'd like to go over four uh, points that I think cover those needs that I referred to for cancer survivors. Uh, and the first area is what I refer to as systematic medical monitoring and management. Now this encompasses a number of things that I'll, I'll go over uh, briefly individually here. So for retinoblastoma patients, obviously this means ensuring optimal vision. And for those who have a prosthesis, ensuring that their prosthetis, prosthesis fit and function are optimized. And, and clearly, this involves having a close working relationship with ophthalmology. We don't do these functions ourselves in our clinic, but we make sure that they get done and that the patient, uh, we facilitate that uh, work uh, done by the experts uh, in that area. For patients who are appropriate, we screen for hearing loss uh, using audiometry, for example, if carboplatin has been used for prior treatment, and similarly screen for peripheral neuropathy if incristine has been used. 
Um, other uh, agents such as doxorubicin or cyclophosphamide are used much less often nowadays in the treatment of um, retinoblastoma, but some of our patients who have been off therapy longer have those exposures, and so we need to monitor for other late effects such as uh, cardiomyopathy and other uh, sorts of conditions. You know, we've seen in this conference that uh, gene testing is critically important, and uh, again, it is not our role so much to be doing that ourselves in the survivorship clinic, but we ensure that it has been done, that it's been complete, that it's state-of-the-art, and that it's been uh, interpreted appropriately. Uh, along with that, if patients are at risk, we help monitor for second malignancies and provide and reinforce, reinforce the genetic counseling that's been given. Uh, and then finally, we do make sure that other family members who may, at risk are, may, may be at risk are aware of that and have been counseled appropriately. The second area that's important for survivors of retinoblastoma is psychosocial support. So this encompasses uh, screening for, for positive emotional adaptation that relates to all of the functions, uh, including vision, uh, functional differences related to that, and self-acceptance and self-confidence uh, that we've heard referred to already in this conference uh, in their uh, peer settings. This means supporting the patients and their parents with uh, directed guidance, um, arranging for psychology evaluations where needed, uh, very importantly, ensuring that school accommodations have been provided, and connecting patients and families with uh, retinoblastoma-specific and also general cancer survivorship uh, support groups and advocacy groups. The third area is uh, health information and promotion. And what we're understand, pro providing here is a realistic understanding of the risks for late effects and opportunities for risk reduction. And there are many uh, that we can uh, point to, but a couple of examples would be for hearing loss. So if patients have been exposed to carboplatin, for example, they're at risk already or their ears are primed, if you will, for hearing loss. So we make sure that these uh, teenagers, for example, are counseled to keep the volume down on the ear pods that they wear uh, with their music, and if they're uh, involved in employment opportunities where there's a lot of loud ambient noise, we counsel them to be cautious about that and to use ear protection. If peripheral neuropathy is present, present uh, advising physical therapy. For cardiomyopathy, trying to reduce comorbidities through exercise, maintaining their weight and a healthy diet. And then for second malignancies, as has been suggested, there are lots of opportunities for reducing risk by using sunscreen, uh, avoiding smoking, and avoiding ionizing radiation. There was a discussion earlier about dental x-rays, for example. We would try to reinforce that type of a message in our clinic. And then finally, general health uh, measures that we should all be following but are particularly important for cancer survivors. And then finally, uh, our financial challenges. And these, these are actually really important because if patients are to receive lifelong care uh, as cancer survivors, then they need to plan accordingly. Um, there's something that, uh, that we like to refer to in our clinic as the golden triangle of cancer survivorship. And the three points are education, employment, and health insurance. It's not often appreciated by teenagers. I know that when I was that age, I wouldn't have had a clue uh, how these three, three things interrelate and, and why they're important. But finishing high school education and, and beyond, uh, going to the highest level as, as possible, uh, getting employment that has health benefits that then provides health insurance, which is needed in order to access the long-term care that's needed. Um, navigating our health insurance uh, landscape is uh, anything but easy nowadays, and our social worker, one of her most important functions really is helping to problem solve around these areas and educate families. Uh, just uh, getting close to wrapping up here um, is an important point about adult survivors of retinoblastoma, and that has to do with healthcare transition. What healthcare transition refers to, broadly speaking, is the transfer of survivorship care from a pediatric hospital or provider to adult-focused um, facilities or providers. And the whole point of healthcare transition when a patient ages out of pediatric care and, and uh, becomes an adult is to ensure that any lifelong care that is needed remains both medically appropriate but also age appropriate. So it is not really rare for patients who are treated at a pediatric center for a pediatric cancer like retinoblastoma to be followed for life at those hospitals. But I think it's, it's clear that somebody who is uh, in their 40s or 50s 
um, going to a child, uh, you know, pediatric oriented facility, uh, it has some, uh, it's better than nothing for sure. But adult patients develop adult problems and it becomes really difficult uh, to access adult specialists when you're working in a pediatric center. So again, it's making sure that these patients um, are in an age appropriate setting. So ideally, uh, coordinated transition is uh, not easy to achieve, uh, but it is uh, best achieved, I think, in a unified sort of program, ideally. Um, that means starting early, uh, starting to educate patients when they're in their early teens. I'm talking now about the patients themselves, uh, starting to get them brought on board about why they need to be listening to the conversations, why they shouldn't just let mom and dad handle everything. As they get older, they need to have a good understanding of their own health issues. We try to identify adult care partners, uh, working with the treating team to make sure that there's a smooth handoff. Um, all patients need to have what's referred to as a survivorship care plan, which is at its very basic uh, uh, form, is a, uh, uh, a summary of the treatment that they've had and uh, ideally the sort of monitoring that they should receive. We need to make sure that their insurance plan and providers is in place so that it will move with them from the pediatric center to the adult center, an incredibly complicated and much more difficult task than it should ever have to be, um, if I may just add that. And then uh, finally, making sure that the patient and family know uh, what you need to have uh, in the way of monitoring. There's no better advocate than your own self. So the way that we accomplish this uh, at uh, Children's Hospital Los Angeles and USC is one approach that I only offer as one approach. There are other ways of doing this that are uh, superb and um, um, the, they can offer their own experience as well. But what we do at uh, Children's Hospital Los, Los Angeles is that while the patients are children, uh, they're referred by their primary oncologist to our cancer survivorship program within two years of ending treatment. They undergo an initial comprehensive assessment that identifies their uh, treatment exposures that put them at risk, and then they're followed in parallel on an annual basis uh, with their primary oncologist and ophthalmologist. And then when they turn 21, uh, they're transitioned to adult-focused care. The higher risk patients uh, are transferred to our program over at the Adult uh, cancer, uh, cancer Survivorship Clinic at uh, the USC Norris cancer Comprehensive Cancer Center, and those are, we define as patients who have had prior radiation therapy, certain chemotherapy exposures, uh, or, and or a germline uh, retinoblastoma mutation. And then those who are considered to be at lower risk uh, are transferred actually out of the high intensity setting to their primary care provider. So to just recap, uh, these are the five, uh, five points that I'd like uh, you to leave with. Um, who should be referred to a cancer survivorship clinic? Any child or, or adult uh, treated for retinoblastoma, why? In order to receive optimal comprehensive survivorship care, when? soon after completion of treatment, uh, where, if you have one available, a survivorship clinic, and there are uh, many uh, great clinics located around the country, and I provided a website there uh, th at the Children's Oncology Group that can show you a list. And for how long? Well, at least for high-risk patients, it should be lifelong care. So thank you uh, very much for your attention, but thank you especially to our patients and their families who really have, uh, me personally, taught me so much uh, over the course of taking care of you. Thank you for your continual education. A third speaker, uh, Dr. Catherine Payton, a professor of ophthalmology at the University of British Columbia, and her talk is entitled Brain Tumors, who, when, and how to screen. Dr. Payton. Thank you very much, and thank you again uh, to the organizers and to Dan for asking me to give this talk. Um, Dan always asks me questions I can't answer. <laughs> and so the, this, in fact, I'm going to start by trying to answer brain tumors. Most of what I'm going to say in terms of the diseases you've heard some reference to in multiple talks already today, um, I w did want to bring a slightly different perspective to it, though, especially when it comes to screening. Um, I wanted to pause for a moment and talk about the business of evidence or what evidence looks like 
when you're in the evidence-free zone. A family member asked a question earlier today, and I think we would all love to think that we can answer every question by doing a multi-center, collaborative, randomized, prospective study, which is sort of the gold standard, um, on a go-forward basis. We've identified why people can't do those kinds of studies on some rare diseases. Uh, or things where uh, the volume of patients doesn't justify it, or where the pace of change is making such a uh, difference in how things are done that by the time you get to the study end point, uh, the way treatment has happened is changing. But um, it is becoming far more common to try and put information together. So some of the things I'm going to refer to today, I'd like to reassure the uh, retinoblastoma patients and family members and survivorship group that there are alternatives when you can't answer a question that way. And one of the alternatives is doing what's called meta-analysis. There are fairly stringent ways of looking at data that's assembled from multiple different sources. And some of the things I'm going to say today are, come from that, that basis. Um, they will choose which um, literature searches to look at. They will set criteria ahead of time. There's a set of rules for doing this well. It generates a whole list of articles to look at, criteria to apply, and then out of maybe 1,500 or 2,000 articles, you might get down to 20 that you can actually analyze. And so that is one of the alternative ways of answering a question. What kind of brain tumors, Dan? So I decided I would uh, look at three, and um, all of these are in the brain. Um, the ones that are in the optic nerve at the time of diagnosis we heard earlier are going to be local, but they may actually become brain tumors, either because they've invaded through the cut end of the optic nerve or into the CSF at the time of the original presentation, and that time point is important. The second type of uh, brain tumor that I think of in retinoblastoma are the trilateral tumors. And the trilateral retinoblastoma tumors aren't necessarily all the same tumor. They're the pineal ones that are midline and ones that are either supracellular or intracellular, but close to the time of uh, the retinoblastoma and within that pediatric framework. And then the third type are the truly later ones, the second tumors that happen either with or without radiation. What about the ones at the optic nerve at the time of diagnosis? Any time your clinical view of the optic nerve is obscured, as you heard earlier today, you may not know what's going on and you need to get some sort of imaging to help you at the time you make your primary treatment decision. So a retinal detachment could obscure it, a cataract can sometimes obscure it, vitreous hemorrhage, media opacity, or tumor actually hanging over the nerve, or some other change in the front part of the eye. So you cannot physically see what's going on at the nerve, and you'd like that information before you choose your first treatment. Um, this is an example of what happens when there's tumor actually in the nerve. Nothing could be seen in the front of this eye. I thank the group in Toronto for this uh, example of pathology. And in fact, all of this was obscuring what was going on here. But you can see here that there's tumor in the nerve and actually also adjacent to the nerve. Um, the practicalities of assessing what's going on in the nerve at the time of diagnosis may not be as simple as you think. Uh, in some centers where the exam under anesthesia is done and where the imaging, pediatric imaging is done may not be in the same center. Um, I consider myself uh, fortunate and didn't know so. Um, our MRI is down the hallway from our OR and usually they don't look like putting children to sleep twice. And we will often have one anesthetic, MR, EUA, primary treatment. So I'm getting the information right at the time, but some flow like that needs to happen in order for a good decision to be made. This is particularly true in the era when some of the decisions are, do you actually salvage the eye with intraarterial chemo, or do you go ahead further on? 
um, the recommendations I would make about imaging at the time is it's absolutely essential. Um, I will come in a moment to why I think uh, MR is still a good technique, even though what Dan said sounded a little bit discouraging. So you want a high-resolution MR. You want to look at the optic nerve and the brain. Why the brain? Because of the trilateral retinal blastomas. So approximately 5% of heritable retinal blastomas will have the trilateral form where there is tumor in the brain. Um, a large group, first of all, started by Taro Kivala in Finland and then the group in Amsterdam uh, or in the Netherlands that have a big data set because they've got a wonderful registry and they've spend a lot of time looking at it, n are able to show us that 95% of these brain tumors happen by the age of five. So we have our framework between the time of diagnosis and age five. 60% um, of the asymptomatic tumors uh, happen within the f year from the time of retinal blastoma diagnosis. What do I mean by that? The children have not got headache, vomiting, uh, cranial bulging, something else that tells you the tumors are found on the imaging. It turns out that if the tumors are found uh, earlier at a smaller size, the survival is better, particularly for the pinealoblastomas. And there is a lot of work from the meta-analysis group as well that shows that. So a smaller tumor, better outcome, uh, better survival. Uh, here is an example that happened in our, my own center where a child was seen for this small eye, but actually neurosurgery saw them immediately because the midline tumor had actually created such pressure. There were big dilated ventricles. Um, so the uh, recommendation I would have out of the trilateral retinal blastomas is at screening, and then probably up to at least age of five years. The question is how often, and there isn't really good data about that. And you then start getting into local practices. How much does it cost? How easily accessible is it? But um, I think you need to consider this. Who should you consider it for? The ones that are heritable, but I will come back to my table from earlier this morning and say you have to be careful that you've caught the ones that you're not sure might be heritable. And those would be the ones that are either mosaic or um, poor penetrant. Um, this is an example of a child who actually had quite advanced disease and did not achieve cure and died from disease. Um, and then we come to the third type of brain tumors, the ones that are intracranial. Uh, when I went looking for this, I had a slightly more difficult time finding it, and Ruth might elucidate some more information for us from the NCI database. It appears that these are maybe related to irradiation, either irradiation of the eye or the trilateral irradiation aiming at trilateral disease. If we look at um, the second tumor rate, we heard it was 36% at 50 years. And it seems that the age at diagnosis and the age at which a child may have been irradiated is a risk. And the children who received irradiation at less than one year of age have a higher risk. And children who received external beam radiotherapy and as well as chemotherapy um, may have an increased risk. Um, however, trying to find what's actually intracranial data is somewhat difficult. And the ones who'd had previous external beam therapy, what I was finding was temporal fossa tumors and sinus tumors, not really intracranial tumors. And I looked hard. I found one or two references. Um, one of them talked about meningiomas, and where I come from, meningiomas are usually not a nasty malignant disease. So what kind of brain tumors actually happen in these children? It may be in field. The child that I showed you survived her prime, primary um, pineal tumor, which was cured uh, and treated with curative intent with chemotherapy. However, she developed a second tumor in the brain, which was a, a different pathologic type that was treated with proton irradiation in, uh, in Texas. And she survived that. It shrank, and she did well. And she developed a third type of brain tumor called DPIG, which was actually her sort of final event. And 
The third one might have been radiation related. The second one wasn't, and it's really hard to find track of all those things, but I think they're an indication that either our treatments or the existence of retinoblastoma alone can show some of these kinds of tumors, and it may be somewhat, something to do with the child or the mutation, as well as just the fact they've got retinoblastoma. So I would recommend, based on the second tumors, that they scre they're screening between now we're up to age five years where we stop from the trilaterals up to age 20 by MRI. Is this reasonable? This part, I'm not so sure about. How are you going to screen them? We all know that you're supposed to avoid CT scan because of the radiation dose. And if you try looking at this literature, the radiation dose recommended by manufacturers and actually needed to diagnose all sorts of diseases, not just retinoblastoma, is vastly different. The radiation doses were high, but because of this, uh, retinoblastoma patients are um, to avoid CT scanning altogether whenever possible. So you'd be taking uh, MR data. And the best MR data that I can find comes from the group in the Netherlands. There is a European group who are trying to assemble data because no one has really good data in their own center. And it's called the European Retinoblastoma Imaging Collaboration. It has multiple centers uh, around Europe. Some of those centers are represented here today. And they have people with expertise in large treating centers who are working on the data. Um, th the group in Netherlands has a proposal for a protocol with thin slice, high resolution, either 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla coils to get good images to look at the optic nerves for the time of diagnosis and to look at the pineals. Um, but if you look at the sensitivity and specificity material and you look at the analysis they've done of scans from multiple centers, you would look and say the ability to detect invasion into the optic nerve at the time of diagnosis at the primary retinoblastoma isn't so good. And in fact, their marker of invasion was actually the size and volume of the retinoblastoma itself. So that's, I think, where Dan's sort of discouragement about can MR really help us tell comes from. So an expert center is needed with good protocols, and I have every confidence that this collaborative group is working on building better protocols that will help us know what the right thing is to do for the fewest slices the best number of scans in order to keep these children safe and treated. So just a quick example of what you can do for imaging. On a B scan, you may be able to see what's going on at the nerve. You won't see beyond it. And even in good hands, I'm not sure that you can see invasion well. In an MR, you will get an image like this. And depending on what weighting and staining you use, you may get better indicators. And then, of course, on a CT scan, you'll get a different set of images as well. Realistically, around the world, there will be lots of centers still using CT scans. And there may even be centers in very developed, capable places that say, we don't need to do an MR after the time of diagnosis. So I'm come back to our actual real world presentation of retinoblastomas and say the following, that the patients who are truly non-heritable, the somatic mutation, you probably don't need to image those ever again once you know their genetic type and once you know that they don't have involvement at the nerve at the time, unless there's a problem during treatment or a problem when you do the enucleation. The bilaterals and, and trilaterals, probably the mosaics that you'll know about here that are potentially um, uh, heritable, and then low penetrant disease, all of these carry the risk of the trilateral disease and need scanning probably up to age five years. And then those other second tumors, I think, belong very much in a survivorship clinic with survivorship advice and local practice about what we're doing with following for potential brain tumors. Um, the osteogenic sarcomas may be considered a brain area tumor, but actually they're not kind of in the brain, so I didn't include them. Um, and then the other thing we've heard about a little bit today and no one's spoken of is um, 
MRI for whole body screening, and I think that's probably part of a survivorship group as well for late pediatrics. So thank you very much. I will um, look forward to hearing what people say. I gave a couple of slides of what we might do for families and survivors in order to help them carry the information. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, that was a wonderful, wonderful talk and, and review of what we know and perhaps what we don't know. Um, I'm going to transition a bit um, to, I think, what a lot of adult survivors um, have to deal with, and that is transitioning to adult care with a primary care provider. So if I can have my first slide, please. And when I'm not at a tertiary children's hospital, I'm at a tertiary cancer center and it's still hot and humid in Houston, regardless of weather place I am. And um, what have we learned so far from the past speakers? Well, we know that everybody who carries the RB1 gene is at risk for other tumors in life. We know that. And that's going to be everybody that has bilateral disease and some of those that have unilateral disease. And we've already talked, and we can't emphasize enough how profound genetic testing has been in helping us um, you know, I still remember when genetic testing was still experimental and it wasn't commercially available. So again, a huge leap forward. And we've learned which tumors and when. We know that these are sarcomas and melanomas and uterine tumors. We, we know which tumors are going to happen, more or less. So what can you do? Well, in life you can't get rid of all risk but you can mitigate your risk. And we've heard some very pragmatic issues that I think every person with heritable retinoblastoma should consider, and every parent of a child with heritable retinoblastoma should consider. Things as simple as avoiding sun exposure, avoiding unnecessary radiation, and avoiding smoking, particularly for our survivors who are in their teenage years and perhaps may not understand the implications of all of the decisions that they make. We've heard about an impassioned talk about the role of survivorship clinics. But as we say in Texas, Houston, we have a problem. And the problem is, is that many patients are not treated at specialist center. I'm amazed at how many patients are, don't have the ability to come to a place like LA or Vancouver or Toronto or Texas they're treated by great people, but not necessarily individuals outside of that combined pediatrician and ophthalmologist relationship. So all these other aspects that are terribly important, they may not have access to. And what happens? Well, they get cured of this disease, they grow up, and then specialists may or may not be involved in their care as an adult. Um, and once you're cured, sort of the team changes. Um, frankly, I don't think enough adults transition to survivorship clinic. The concept of survivorship clinics have evolved significantly, I think, in the past decade. We didn't talk about survivorship as much even in the field of pediatric oncology as we do today. And even less of those who ultimately make it to a pediatric survivorship clinic may not be in one that have the unique expertise with retinoblastoma. We're all here talking about this disease, but remember, it's an exceptionally rare disease when you consider all the other things, all the other cancers that children get and survive from, particularly leukemias. And then we have children that are, frankly, never even told that they had retinoblastoma, and it's not that uncommon. You know, you don't talk about cancers in some families. The child is cured, no one talks about it, and guess what? You have an adult who has a heritable form of retinoblastoma and is unaware that he or she carries a disease that puts them at other risk for other tumors and their children at risk for other tumors. So suddenly when their children have retinoblastoma, guess what? We have to educate not only mom or dad about their child who has this malignancy, but about their own risk for malignancies. And as I think some who have already spoken to here today, you know, children grow up, they move, they, they move far away, and they may not be anywhere near a specialist center, much less a cancer center at all. So what about the general, uh, the, the average generalist, the adver average GP? Well, most RB patients are used to being around specialists all the time. 
you, and particularly those who are listening online and are here today, probably know more about your disease than many clinicians do. You probably understand more about the disease, the genetics, and the second tumorous than the average GP does, because you may be one of only one or two people in that practice if you're in a small town uh, in, in the middle of the United States or in Canada. And here's the secret. The secret is your average PCP not, may not know that much about retinoblastoma and probably may or may not be up to date on all the data that we've talked and presented about today. And even in my own center, even in, in, in a place like MD Anderson, which is a tertiary cancer center, they deal with cancers all the time, they may not be aware of all the specific malignancies that relate to that particular patient because here again, it's an exceptionally uh, rare cancer. So this is where empowerment is important. You have to be your best advocate. And so I'd like to present to you a patient of mine who's an adult survivor with retinoblastoma because if I'm going to tell you what some of the secrets are, I think this is a perfect example of a person who has um, incorporated many of those concepts long before there were survivorship clinics or advocacy the way we talk about. Uh, she was diagnosed in 1967 at the, the center in New York, diagnosed at age three months in the first eye and then at one year in the other eye. She was treated with enucleation. In her chart, it described how she was treated with a shot of poison, uh, which was the uh, predecessor for intra-arterial chemotherapy, uh, triethylene melamine years ago, and then external beam radiotherapy. And she survived. And she eventually moved to a town outside of Houston, but not Houston proper. And she has gone on to develop many non-ocular tumors. And this is just a list of them. No surprise to Dr. Kleinerman, who's already presented many of these tumors in her database, but osteosarcomas, leiomyosarcomas, um, necrotic spindle lesions of the groin, basal cell carcinomas, it goes on and on. When I f saw her, she had developed her seventh tumor in the radiated field. But guess what? 2017, she's alive and well, she's cancer free, she's married, she has adopted children, and she has an amazing quality of life. So what's her secret? What can we learn from this uh, amazing patient of mine? She knew about her risks for second tumors. She, as an adult, went annually to cancer screening. And the biggest difference is, is that, and I've seen this over the years as I've worked with her, is she listens to her body. If something isn't quite right, she brings it immediately to medical attention. She says, Doc, this spot wasn't there before. And she's an advocate for herself and says, we need to get this image. We need to get this looked at. Uh, the sarcoma that we diagnosed in 2014 happened after multiple images because they didn't see anything at first. And she's like, I have this strange pain in my socket. And people were trying to give her migraine symptoms and other sort of symptoms. And she was spot on all along. She didn't ignore the lumps and bumps and, and other atypia that, that they have. So how do you as a patient speak to your primary care provider? Well, this is a sort of bold statement, but assume they know nothing about retinoblastoma. May or may not be right. But be frank with them and ask if they ever had a patient with retinoblastoma. And share their, um, you know, be aware of your tumor risk and share that very openly and honestly with your physician. Ask if there's a screening program in your locality. They may, may or may not be one. Even if there isn't a formal screening program, there may be a local oncologist who's interested in that area. And then have a very low threshold to bring anything atypical up with your physician. So there's another point that I would say, this is a, a statement from my colleague Bertel D'Amato, and it's a bit crude, but I think most oncologists would understand it. I think it applies specifically to this patient population. You know, when in doubt, cut it out. The, there are rare tumors that develop in RB cohorts, um, tumors that we don't necessarily see in other patients. And there's a lot of atypia, and some of them may be a pre-malignant state. Some of them are states where if we can just cut it out, it's out, it's over, the patient doesn't have to worry about it anymore. And it assures everyone, including the patient, even if it's a benign lesion, this was nothing, I don't have to worry about it, and I can go on with my life taking care of my family and friends. So here are some of my conclusions and tips for your PCP. Uh, be your best advocate. Uh, most of the people in this room probably are. You know, as you transition to adult care, continue to advocate for specialist care. That may be in the form of a survivorship clinic if you're fortunate enough to be at a big center. 
um, but seek out cancer screening programs, they're probably in your community. If you have a very frank and open discussion with your PCP, don't make any assumptions about their knowledge base of this exceptionally rare disease, and don't hesitate to bring things up with your physician that look atypical because you figure it's nothing. Bring it up, discuss it, and deal with it. So um, I'm just going to keep looking down at Dr. Barry, and she's going to tell me when we run out of time, because we have sort of a discussion period going. So we have three minutes, marvelous. So we're going to go to the online questions, because that's how amazing we are. Um, so these are questions that were put out to us, and the first question comes from Australia and says, will a child ever be, quote, in the clear of retinoblastoma? What about second cancers? So maybe, Dr. Kleinerman, you want to comment about, you know, when are they free and clear of second cancers? Let's assume we're talking about heritable retinoblastoma. I would say they're always at risk. That's, I mean, I think that's what... Why don't you tell them the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I, I think that they're always at risk if they have a germline RB1 mutation, unfortunately. But so they have a one in three chance by the time they're 50. And I think and Dr. Fryer's talk clearly pointed that out. It's a lifelong survivorship. It really is. Uh, you, you know, there, there's a reason why he and others advocate for continued screening because those risks continue. And there isn't a day where you just say, Thank you, you don't need to come back. Yes, we have a hand up from our geneticist. Um, not a geneticist, you had a field, but I was just getting in line to ask a question. So Go ahead. Okay, I'll let them get in there. Um, I'm going to get my She sort of okay. cut in front of Robin Kish. I but did. That's okay. That's Is okay. that okay? <laughs> so I just, uh, first I wanted to say thank you so much to all the panelists, because this is something so important to so many of us survivors here, and it's so, so helpful. And of course, I have a couple questions. <laughs> um, try to make them brief. Um, one, I'm, I'm really excited about the model at the Children's Hospital LA USC Survivorship Clinic. Thank you so much, Dr. Fryer, for having that program. I, um, I actually tried to create something in Palo Alto, California. I went to an oncologist and say, hey, look at this data. I had retinoblastoma, and they said, oh, you're so healthy, bye. And I was really disappointed. Um, and I'm so happy to see that what I had envisioned when I learned about this actually exists. I just tried to go on to the Children's Oncology Group website, and I had a really, I just spent like 10 minutes looking and had a really hard time finding any other clinics that are similar that would really understand retinoblastoma. Do you, it sounds like, and LA and maybe MD Anderson, do you panelists know of any other clinics so that we can spread the word to people here and online about where we might want to go to get some better specialized uh, long-term care? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think um, that retinoblastoma long-term follow-up clinics are, are normally nested in an overall cancer survivorship clinic, so the question would really be, or the search would really be around finding um, a cancer survivorship clinic that, um, you know, continues care long into adulthood. Um, so there are many pediatric cancer survivorship clinics around the country, many fine ones. It, in fact, it's really become the standard of care in childhood cancer treatment to have access to formal, systematic, long-term follow-up. I think what's uh, less common are, uh, are clinics that actually have a formal transition program. Um, they're not uh, they're not rare, and they're becoming more common, um, you know, with each year that passes, because we all recognize that transition of survivorship care, at least for high risk populations, is the appropriate way to to uh, you know uh, monitor our patients. Um, but uh, they're not easy to run. I can tell you that uh, they're they're loaded with uh, lots of uh, barriers and difficulties that you know are. are you know, in some ways a constant struggle, you know, to overcome. So that's why they're not just uh, with the snap of a finger available everywhere. Um, but I think that uh, uh, the Children's Oncology Group website, um, it may not be that easy to navigate, uh, but there is a list there of uh, uh, long-term uh, follow-up clinics that are available at Children's Oncology Group centers and um, uh, that's updated every three or four years. So hopefully that would provide a place to get started. Maybe I, think, I can I help work on that. the other thing I, I would add is, is that uh, a couple of things. Number one, uh, survivorship has transitioned, as you point out, to, to standard of care. And increasingly, 
Adult cancer hospitals are also about prevention. Prevention is becoming an increasing role. We have prevention clinics and high-risk patients and those with other syndromes like Lee Frau many and those sort of things. So I think not infrequently, those who have a strong genetics program <laughs> will often have a strong survivorship and prevention program. So that's mm -hmm. a start for some patients. Mm -hmm. I can tell you another thing for us that we did in our combined program in Houston is we had to have an annual internal audit. We look to see where we're doing well, where we're not doing well. One of the things we really self-criticized ourselves and said, we're not sending enough of our patients to survivorship clinics. Anderson has a survivorship clinic. Texas Children's has a survivorship clinic. That means that access should be available regardless of insurance for most patients under some mechanism. And you know there also needs to be an internal look by those who are managing their care saying, this is becoming a, another important focal point. And we talked about therapies. And we talked about intraarterial, intravitreal, and, and all that takes. And we talk about um, you know, counseling, genetics, and pathology. Well, this is turning into the next spoke of the wheel that is part of that lifelong care. And I think that's evolving and becoming increasingly important. So I, I think in five years, the, we won't be having this discussion. We're going to have a more fine-tuned discussion about, well, this is my survivorship clinic. This is your survivorship clinic. What does the data show that we need to do? Mm -hmm. How are we doing on time? May okay. I ask no one time? more Finish? quick? Okay, no time. Sorry. Oh. She's in charge. She <laughs> says no time, no time. Oh, this is horrible. This is so much more to ask. Okay. Oh, God. Okay, keep your questions, please, and bring them. Um, I just want us to have...